Okay. Uh, hello, greetings. Uh, welcome to session number four of Church History Number Part Two um, for the Southern California Seminary. Uh, let's start our time with a prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you again for this opportunity to uh, study church history, study your work throughout the history of mankind and how you have preserved your church, your word uh, throughout all the challenges uh, throughout many centuries. Uh, Father God, may you bless our time. May you open our mind and um, help us to follow the great uh, uh, examples of positive uh, biblical examples of our heritage and also to avoid mistakes and error and the sins of our ancestors spiritually. Come with our time into your hand, ask your blessing upon all the dear students and may we learn uh, church history and learn the principle from it and apply them to our life and ministry at the present time. Uh, we pray all these things and we pray for the health of your church all around the world in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> before we go anywhere, let's take a look at our syllabus so we know uh, what we are supposed to do during this week. Let me go to share a screen. One moment. I think that's it. Yeah. <clears throat> As you can see, we are second on 2nd of August, session number four. Uh, Lord willing, we are going to look at chapters 35, 36, and 37. And uh, we come to the last chapter of our legacy, Dr. Hannah, chapter 9. Uh, and uh, by the end of this week, before Sunday midnight, you're supposed to turn in your midterm exam. The midterm is going to be over the reading material from sessions 1 through 4. The study guide will be provided. A study guide for sessions one to three will please go to the previous lessons. I'm going to in the on the popular in the popular for a session four. I'm going to put the study guides only for chapters 35, 36, and 37. But for the previous chapters, please go back to the previous lessons because they will be the same. Um. And again, the summary and evaluation paper uh, for our legacy will be due by Sunday this week. And part, please participate in the discussion on Popley also. Okay. All right. If you have any question, feel free to contact me. Uh, so let's go to our PowerPoint. All right, let's go back and expand this. Uh, <clears throat> we are going basically, mainly we are focusing on 18th century, the late, uh, I mean, 19th century, late uh, 18th century and uh, early part of the 20th century, but mainly we are focusing on the 19th century, the state of Christianity in England and European continent, and later on in America. Uh, the overall picture of this period is the basic general elements. Uh, for the details, please go to the chapter. Uh, the old mercantilism uh, process in North and South America started to fade away, and the new mercantilism in Asia and Africa, Africa uh, is coming to fruition. Uh, in the old mercantilism, colonies were considered were viewed for the benefit of the mother country. In the new mercantilism, colonies are viewed as a source of raw materials and also markets for the mother country. And this is specifically, this new mercantilism uh, came into being during and after the industrial revolution. Now, what is mercantilism? I, I'm not sure. I think it was the last lesson we talked about that. 
what basically mercantilism is the economic doctrine in which the government control of foreign trade is of paramount importance for the ensuring the prosperity, security, and the stability of the state. Now, oh, what is industrial revolution that had such an impact? Because, because you see, with a change in mercantilism uh, from old to the new, and considering colonies as a source of raw materials and markets for the mother country, the views, the dealing of the uh, you know, European countries uh, toward these colonies will start to change uh, as we are going to see that in this chapter. The Industrial Revolution refers to the period from the 18th to the 19th centuries where major changes in agriculture, manufacturing, mining, transportation, and technology had a profound effect on the social, uh, socioeconomic and cultural condition of the times. It began in Britain, then subsequently spread throughout the Western Europe, North America, Japan, and eventually the whole world. And that's an interesting picture of the Industrial Revolution. Yes, you can see the, the smoke coming from the uh, these factories, and you see the homes of these workers so close to each other, and really a polluted uh, environment. But it passes through these times toward uh, the better times. Now, <clears throat> as the great market, the new mercantilism considers the colonies as the source for the raw material and also the market for the pro for the products of the factories in the mother country, uh, then arise a responsibility to civilize and convert the natives and uh, to the need to civilization and to convert the natives. And that give away to many, many missionary activities. That's why this period of time, the 19th century is con considered, it is called the great century of mission. Um, so you have uh, religious expansion uh, hand in hand with territorial and economical expansion. Um, you see, if you want, when when industrial revolution has happened in your country, so you need raw material, and but you also need people to buy your product. Uh, you can sell part of your product, part of it, in in your own country, in the uh, in the mother country, but there will be surplus, and uh, you know you want to those colonies to be able to purchase your products. That's the reason that it gave a, um, a push toward uh, conversion of the natives uh, civil, to civilize them. And it was considered part of that. Uh, but, and I don't have any problem with that. Part of the mentality in that time that to advance the civilization and create a market uh, for the um, product of the mother country, we need to also bring these people to fate and make their society uh, arise the level of life, the level of advancement in those societies so that they can observe our product. And at the same time, maybe they can produce their own products too. So I'm not, some people look at this as a, uh, you know, horrible colonialism. I'm not looking at it that way. There were abuses of power in some cases, but uh, in many cases, they were also advancements, advancement of the betterment of uh, level of uh, life, education, health, agriculture, and even industry. Now, during this period of time, the 19th century in the Great Britain, you, um, as far as the church is concerned, you have uh, three trends going on. Number one, you have revivalism in the Anglican church and the non-conformist churches. Non-conformist churches refer to the churches who were not part of the official state church of England, the Anglican church. There were missionary activities and social reforms. Uh, missionaries were going to different parts of the world 
uh, spreading the gospel. And at the same time, they were involved in social reforms in those countries, fighting against child labor, child slavery, abuses of women, and uh, fighting against illiteracy, a lack of hygiene, and many other things. Uh, in the, lots of Middle Eastern countries, I know that the first uh, hospitals and schools for, you know, for blind people, uh, for uh, hospitals uh, to take care of the people with leprosy were founded by Christian missionaries. Now, uh, you have these great missionary activities, missionaries from England and also America going to different parts of the world. But it's interesting. Remember, oh, I don't know if you were in the first part of the class in the last module. I always said, I said that in order to make uh, church history interesting or history in general, try to find uh, the connections between the event, connected dots. Uh, <clears throat> You know, as we have this great century of mission, the 19th century, something happens in the middle uh, and uh, almost to the, at the end of it, the beginning of 20th century. Satan is not going to just sit around and do nothing. So there is a counterattack by the kingdom of darkness. In what forms? Both from inside and outside. Uh, from outside. Odd, I mean, kind of outside because the the product, the result was is not considered within the Christian main line. Uh, you have two attacks: one in the form of creation of the Mormonism, the Mormon Church, and also in the mid nineteenth century, and also early twentieth century. In nineteen o four, you have the start of Jehovah Witness movement which they're both cults and consider outside the Christian main line. But also there was an attack from each side. In 1906, you have so-called the Azusa Street Revival, and, uh, and then you have all these charismatic Pentecostal churches coming from there, uh, which you, when you compare to the uh, great works of missionaries such as William Carey, um, um, and uh, Hudson Taylor and others who were Samuel Zwemers and who went to different parts of the world and brought the, you know, the yeah. rational gospel. You know, that uh, uh, Ozzy Street revival was a disaster. Uh, you can read um, the history of um, uh, Ozzy Street so called revival in the, in many different books that are available. Um, Dr. John McCarter has an excellent book on the history of the Pentecostalism and charismatic movement that I encourage you to read that. And it's embarrassing, to be honest with you. Uh, so, you see, as we have the great Christian, uh, a great century of mission, there's also counterattack from outside, from Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness, and from inside, from Charismatic and Pentecostalism. So that's one trend that's going on in Great Britain of the revivalism. The second trend in Great Britain is ritualism in the Anglican Church. A strong liturgical movement start growing in the Anglican Church. And thirdly, liberalism, liberal elements uh, started influencing all different denomination, not only in England, but also in the continent and unfortunately also in North America. Now let's, that last one needs to be explained more. The liberal Christianity, uh, liberal Christianity or liberal theology as it's sometimes called, is an umbrella term covering diverse philosophically and religious movement and ideas within Christianity from late 18th century onward to our time. Uh, <clears throat> it really, there is no such a thing as a set of creed uh, that if you believe in these, there are, you are considered liberal, but there are common elements. In liberal Christian teaching, 
which is not Christian at all, uh, these elements are common. Man's reason is stressed and is treated as the final authority. Liberal theologians seek to reconcile Christianity with secular science and modern thinking. Now, again, you can't not just it, please, you know, these things should be considered all of them together. In other words, if there are some Christians who try to reconcile Christian uh, faith with science, that doesn't mean that that person is uh, liberal. If you have to, con it's a, the summation, it's the the gathering of all of these elements together that creates liberal Christianity, which is not Christian at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but in doing so, they treat science as all knowing and the Bible as a fable and false. Uh, for, so, you know, just from myth. Uh, that's different from some Christian who tries to find harmony between the scripture and the modern science. And there is no tension between the scripture and modern science. There is tension between the scripture and what is called naturalism, uh, which is not science, it's a school of thought. Uh, and uh, so that's the whole different ballgame. Uh, for example, Genesis, uh, early chapters, uh, uh, teaching on creation are reduced to poetry, fantasy, having a message, but you are not so, supposed to take Genesis as historical, literal account, in spite of the fact that the Lord Jesus has spoken of those chapters as historical, literal records. Uh, mankind is not as totally depraved uh, the, therefore, liberal theologian have a very optimistic view of the future of mankind. Of course, these optimistic views were throughout church history and throughout human history were shattered by the First World War and the Second World War. And that's when you start having uh, fallout and people just drifting away from the uh, Christian faith and belief in God. The social gospel is emphasized while the inability of fallen men to fulfill it, fulfill it is denied. They believe man can uh, reach us its uh, apex of potentiality. Whether a person is saved from his sin and its penalty in hell is no longer the issue. But the main thing is how man treat his fellow man. Love of our fellow man becomes the defining issue. Again, Love of our fellow man is important, but it's not number one issue in the Christian faith. Uh, I'm not saying it's unimportant. I'm just saying that there, there's a, there are elements of priority. Therefore, as a result of this kind of thinking by liberal theologian, uh, there are some common characteristics, some far doctrines common among these liberal, uh, supposedly Christian theologians. Number one, they consider the Bible as not God breath, and they don't believe in inerrancy of the scripture. They believe the scripture has errors. Number two, the virgin birth of Christ is only considered as a mythological story, false teaching. Uh, Jesus did not rise from the grave in the bodily form, and they even denied that he was crucified. Uh, Jesus was a good moral teacher, and that's it. Not the Lord, not the Savior of the world. Hell is not real, and man is not lost in sin, and is not doomed to some future judgment without a relationship with Christ through faith. <clears throat> and most of the human authors of the Bibles are not who they are, as they traditionally believe to be. Uh, so for example, they divide the first five books. They attribute them to different authors, not to Moses. They divide the book of Isaiah to three parts and all of that. And the most important thing for man to do is to love his neighbor. Now, again, uh, having love for a fellow man is important. It's a command of the scripture. But uh, uh, before that, uh, it says, love your God with all your heart, your mind, and your a power uh, and love the truth. For more discussion on liberal Christianity, I encourage you to go to 
godquestion.org. They have excellent articles with uh, citing scriptures to respond to that at their site. Okay. At the same time, during this 19th century, there are things happening in the continent. Uh, well, in Scotland, you have the re reunion of diverse group that uh, had left the Church of Scotland. In Ireland, uh, in, despite the Reformation, because of the racial antagonism between the Irish and the British, English uh, and the hatred of the conqueror um, Irish people feeling being conquered by the uh, English people and their hatred toward them. Uh, England accepted uh, Protestantism, but, but Ireland remained Roman Catholic. Um, but uh, one benefit for the Irish uh, church uh, was the disestablishment of the Anglican Church in 1869. But that had to do with the issue of paying taxes to the Anglican Church to support the church. Now, from 1869, that uh, law was annulled and they were not forced to do that so that now they could support their own uh, local church, even Roman Catholic Church, before they had to paid taxes to Anglican church, and also they wanted to support their own churches. So that helped them in that area. In Germany, there was a, a movement of German intermission, uh, which did lots of social work and also evangelistic work. In the Netherlands, uh, Abraham Cooper, uh, a theologian, wrote extensively and he was influential in funding of the Free University of Amsterdam. And ba basically, if you want to com com compare the continental movement with what happening in the United States and, Bri and uh, British Isles, uh, let me, the typo here, let me change that. Okay. Let's go back. Um, the movement in the continental Europe, uh, continent of the Europe, were more socially oriented in comparison to the movement in the United States and the British Isles. Not that they were no no evangelistic work was done. No, I'm not saying that. You know, we had German intermission in Netherlands. We have the writings of Abraham Cooper and the. Uh, University of Free Amsterdam, uh, but in general, we have uh, the movements in the continent, Europe, more leaning towards social gospel in comparison to British eyes and the United States. Now, let's look at some prominent figures within these three trends. Within the evangelical, within the Anglican Church, we have an evangelical wing, and a, one of the most famous one in that category would be a, the, the godly man John Newton. Uh, he has a very interesting biography. I encourage you to read his biography. <clears throat> you know, he came from a family that his mother was a believer, uh, not his father, and his mother prayed for him, shared the gospel with him, but young John Newton rebelled and he had a very wild life. Um, uh, he became a slave trader, you know, and one of his famous uh, uh, quotation that he was very proud of that during the time before he was, he came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that uh, he could, he, he claimed that he could uh, cuss and use obscenity uh, non-stop for one hour without his cussing and uh, profanity be repetitious. Um, anyway, he became a slave trader through a number of events. He himself fall into the hand of the uh, African tribes uh, and uh, he was badly injured 
um, he was saved on the way back to England. Uh, other sailors, they knew him and he had a, such a wretched life that uh, when the ship, their ship was caught in a, a very dangerous storm, they thought that it's because of him. He almost like the story of Jonah, that they wanted to throw him out of the uh, ship so that God's anger will be um, uh, will be uh, the, uh, will be taken away from them. And <clears throat> John Newton was scared at that time. He remembered that uh, the things that her his mother used to share with him, and he kneeled and prayed and gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was converted. Then he went through some training process and he was ordained uh, at, in the Anglican church, but very evangelical. Uh, he's known, he's the author of the famous hymn, Amazing Grace, which has been translated to many, many languages. Uh, also the hymn, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. And also this man, you know, this infidel slave trader, you know, just a vile person who by God's grace, amazing grace, came to fate, uh, influenced William Wilberforce, which later on this William Wilberforce was a vital element in lots of uh, changes in England, uh, especially uh, for uh, probation of slave trades within the British Empire. Here it is. Here he is, William Wilberforce, uh, converted in 1784. He was a member of British Parliament, member of the Church of John Newton, was influenced by John Newton, dedicated his life to the abolishment of slavery in the British Empire. In 1772, a court decision made the ownership of slavery impossible in England. And in 1807, the Parliament passed a law that banned English men from participating in slave trades. Um, and before the President Lincoln war and uh, probation of slavery in the United States, it was done in England by the work of this Christian man. Uh, he wrote Practical Views in 1797. Uh, and in it, he has a plea to for biblical principle to be applied in the arena of politics and social reforms. Uh, if we go to the camp of non-conformists, uh, those who were outside the Anglican Church, again, again, we want to look at the prominent figure. One is John N. Darby. Uh, he was a Christian, and uh, some I know some extreme reform groups they consider him like a uh, like a cult leader but he wasn't he was a a godly man a christian man and uh, did a great service for uh, the church of christ he was a lawyer he became a uh, parish priest originally within the anglican church the church of ireland later he organized the brethren the Brethren Movement or the Brethren Churches uh, in uh, 1831 in Dublin. He taught premillennial uh, form of uh, eschatology that, uh, you know, uh, premillennial, uh, as you know, it's the uh, biblical eschatology, I believe, that it says that before the establishment of the millennial kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, will return. And dispensational view of history, dispensational rapture, meaning uh, pre-trib rapture, before the seven years of tribulation starts, the church will be raptured. And basically, he viewed church, uh, the human history, from a dispensational uh, frame of uh, work. He emphasized the priesthood of all believers. He emphasized direct guidance from the Holy Spirit. That's why in uh, Pilamid Brethren churches, uh, you don't have pastors, even though uh, you know practically somebody will become and act like a pastor because you need to have a pastor. But uh, uh, because their view of the direct guidance of the Holy Spirit and their response and reaction to the Anglican church, they didn't want to have 
uh, ordained pastor. And then there was no ordained ministry, no ordained minister, uh, no church membership, but fellowship. Now, some of it, these are good, but some of them, I think, throughout history has proven that are not practical nor biblical. Uh, but they are, you know, brethren are in general are very godly people. They're students of the Bible. And they were called Pilamid brethren because uh, the Pilamid uh, in England was the chief center of the movement. One of the famous people, again, another famous people uh, that came from the Pilamid brethren background was George Mueller, the founder of a large orphanage and many, many orphanages in England. Another non-confirmist, uh, <laughs> my picture has come too close to Charles Spurgeon. It's Charles Spurgeon, uh, uh, 19th century, uh, wonderful preacher, great preacher. Uh, he, he's he's considered as a Reformed Baptist. He started the Church Metropolitan Tabernacle in 1861, which is still goes on and still is a very good church. I personally know people who are member of that church. Uh, he opened the school, the Pastors College, and before he died, he trained 900 preachers. I encourage you to read his sermons. His uh, sermons are published in a book format. They're wonderful, wonderful person. Even though you are, not, even if you are not a Reformed Baptist, but reading his books are wonderful. Another trend that we have uh, going on in England uh, during the 19th century was uh, missionary efforts. Again, I remember that was a part of the view that they felt that they need to uh, evangelize and uh, civilize um, the uh, these colonies, uh, both in obedience to the command of the Lord Jesus Christ, and also you have to consider the socioeconomic uh, elements of this time after the Industrial Revolution, the need for having a market for the products of the uh, um, factories in England. I'm not saying that that was the only element. No, the, these people have honestly, they had sincere desire and they were sincerely concerned for the spiritual state of the people in different countries and different lands. But this uh, socioeconomic factor was part of the milieu in that era. Uh, he urged churches to send missionaries. He uh, faced some opposition because of the Calvinistic view of these churches that they felt, well, God, if God wants them to come to faith, he will do it. You know, that's the problem with Calvinism that uh, if you take it to the extreme, it becomes uh, uh, very deadly for mission and evangelism. But he went to India. He helped to st establish you know, uh, a London Missionary Society. Uh, he translated the Bible into the language of people in India and also helped with the development of uh, literacy, establishing of a school, many, many works. And his work uh, influenced other missionaries, such as Henry Martin, who went to India and later on to the Middle East for the service of the gospel. Uh, his famous uh, quotation is Ex expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. And he was a leader in the translation of the Bible and many followed his example. We have then also uh, Hudson Taylor, J. Hudson Taylor. He founded China Inland Mission as a faith mission, meaning basically completely, totally on the uh, the gifts and donation from believers without trying to manipulate them. Uh, it's good for some of the missionaries in our time to know that. Uh, in 1819, 40% uh, of all missionaries in China were under 
his mission, China England mission. And he's the one that uh, for the first time uh, broke away from the traditions of the missionaries who disdained Chinese customs and culture. He adopted Chinese custom, Chinese dress. And in fact, that was uh, <clears throat> a very uh, successful, inf influential in uh, spread of the gospel in China. And he decided that he will go to the inland area of China, away from, you know, uh, the the coastal area where there were these famous cities such such as Shanghai that they had many um, uh, you know things that are would make life much more uh, comfortable. The, he urged himself and uh, other missionaries. He he urged people to go to those most difficult parts inside China. But at the same time, these uh, efforts of English missionaries, uh, whether in Far East or other parts, they were faced with other opposition. There was a rise of nationalism in Far East, and not only in Far East, in Africa, in Middle East. And then from mid-19th century and then in early 20th century, we have the rise of communism. An unfortunate linking of missionaries with the Western imperialism, which... Uh, you know, which was baseless, but and that element is still continues. Many people think missionaries are paid by uh, Western uh, governments. Um, this is a good summary of what was going on in the 19th century. Let me see if we have another. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Just in terms of our show. Oh, wait. Um, we will try to watch most of it because of the time time limit if i couldn't uh, play all the video please please watch that yourself you will benefit from for from having such an overview that uh, our dear doctor dr reeve does that uh, regarding the 19th century let me go back to the beginning yeah let's watch part of it in this lecture, we're looking at the 19th century, and we're taking an overview of the period, trying to get a sense of this entire century. And I always love teaching the 19th century in general. It's in the 19th century where it feels that a switch goes off, frankly. You go from the early 1800s, where when the century first dawns, there is not yet even a steam locomotion engine. It still feels very much like the old world, the colonial period, or the times of the early years of the American Republic. By the end, though, just about everything we assume in the modern world is either being invented or the foundations for these later inventions, science or the discoveries, these kinds of things, are finally on the rise. And so we're going to take a look at just the century as a whole. Who are the main players? What are the cultural differences that occur in this century? And then what are the changes that are wrought that form the backdrop of all the church history that we're going to be talking about in the subsequent lectures? And we can begin, as we always tend to do, with the politics. The 19th century saw the fall of a number of political entities that were staples, some going all the way back to the Middle Ages. So in 1806, for example, the Holy Roman Empire finally dissolves. It comes to an end in a number of different rival groups, in particular the Austrian faction rises up to take over the areas of what we now call Germany. As something of an extension of that, you also see Spain begin to fall and retract itself from the enormous amount of leverage that it was putting on areas in South America and Central America, as well as other countries. And it retracts its empires, and it becomes more isolated to the Iberian Peninsula itself. In France, we have the dominant figure of Napoleon, who had himself coordinated in 1804, and whose legacy, in terms of establishing the might of France, is legendary. Two of the bigger powers during the 1800s, though, are the British Empire and the expansion not only of American territory, but of American power as a global player in terms of politics and power and influence. Then much of the story of European politics during the century involves the countries of Europe, for sure, but more often than not, it involves the subjugation of other countries around the world. 
whenever these empires begin to expand or whenever the trade interests come up against the local politics of any given region. And the expansion of the British Empire is, of course, pretty legendary. They take over all kinds of areas out in the Far East. They come to dominate Egypt and parts of the Middle East. Then they rely heavily on their ships and their naval prowess to maintain a foothold in areas that other countries simply couldn't maintain. America does many of the same things in its own backyard. Shortly after the Revolutionary War and the creation of America as its own country, you have the Louisiana Purchase, which brings all types of new land into the American orbit. And this actually sparks a real Western expansion for America in what would become known as the Manifest Destiny Doctrine, the idea that it was the destiny of America to reach the Pacific coast and to claim all of the heartland and all of the eastern and western coasts as part of the states of America. And there are a number of features to this expansion. In 1823, there was the Monroe Doctrine, promulgated by the then president, James Monroe, in which it declared that any European country or any global country that seeks to establish a foothold in North America, in the areas that were part of this Western expansion, that America declared that it would be seen as a threat and that they would intervene should anyone try to plant, even in territories that were not yet part of America. Now, the Monroe Doctrine also argues that America will limit itself to North America and its expansion out west, that they will not get involved with other parts of the world at this point, and that they will let Europe kind of have many of the areas where they were already expanding. But there are a number of places and a number of areas that become folded into America at such a rapid pace that it almost defies logic. In 1835, for about a year, in fact, there was what's known as the Texas Revolution, which is a group of folks who feel that the Mexican government was being too centrist, that it was focused on itself, and that it was imposing order on the area that we now call Texas. And so there was a revolt. And in 1536, Texas won its own independence. And for about 10 years, it was its own nation. It was the Republic of Texas, led by men like Sam Houston. And for a time, it appeared as if it was going to become its own country. In the 1840s, though, there is the annexation of Texas and a number of different other states to their north that eventually brings these regions as well into the American government. Down in Florida and in other parts of America, there were also the Indian Wars. And they go by different names. So, for example, in Florida, there were three Seminole Wars in which America capitalized on the retraction of Spain as a global dominant power to take over parts of these regions for themselves. And of course, Spain put up no fight here, but the natives, the Seminole Indians in particular, didn't want white encroachment onto their territories. And so all throughout the swampy regions down into the Everglades, you have the Seminole Wars as America seeks to take Florida. So much of the labor, though, of the expansion of America, of course, was born on the backs of slaves. And the increased problem of America's addiction, you might say, to the slave trade created a combustible mix in a crisis of identity as America began to question its reliance on slaves for the majority of the manual labor, particularly in the Deep South. And so the American Civil War gets going in the mid part of the 1800s, and it comes to a conclusion in 1865. And it's followed by the reconstruction of the South, and then by the end of the 1800s, the deepening realities of segregation and how, though there had been an end to slavery, the ongoing problems of race in America were not going to subside simply because the North had won the war. So there are lots of problems and controversies and crises of identity in the 1800s in terms of politics. One of the more important things, though, by the end of the 1800s is you see arise a certain brand of imperialism or totalitarianism, at least in the philosophical arenas, those who are trying to justify certain views of the state. In many places, like in Germany, for example, the Austrian kingdoms and others, there arose this idea that coming out of the Holy Roman Empire, there needed to be this German presence, this German might, that ought to dictate what its future was. Now, in the late 19th century itself, a lot of this doesn't come home to roost. However, when we get into the 20th century, when we get to the two world wars, a great deal of the complexity there in terms of nations, imperialism, and totalitarianism, are actually sprung from the soil of the late 19th century idea as to how some of these nations viewed themselves and their own prerogative 
in terms of waging war over certain territories. When we turn from politics, though, to some of the inventions and discoveries of the 19th century, again, this is where you start to see some of those switches go off, where things move from a very colonial cast of the way America was in the early days to increasingly something that looks very modern. So in the 1850s, for example, you have finally a process for the mass production of steel, which is enormously important for all kinds of things, both in terms of military arsenal and in terms of construction. You start to see things like skyscrapers arise in the late 1800s, supported by these steel structures. The horizon of some of these metropolitan areas, in other words, goes increasingly up into the sky. Around the same time, you have the linking up of East and West in 1869 with the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. Suddenly, people could, by train, travel all the way across America, from New York down to California. And what this sparks in America in particular is from 1870 until 1914, with the global crisis in the economy, we have an age that historians call the Gilded Age, which is an age of rapid expansion with opportunists like the Gold Rush folks traveling to all types of areas, creating little boom towns as they seek wealth and fortune in these areas that become part of America. And many of these Western towns, Western cities, even some that are large cities today, often got their start as part of this expansion. You don't simply have, though, the expansion of the railroad systems. In 1886, you actually have the first commercial automobile created, an electrical moving engine. A moving carriage, as many people like to call it in its own day, that no longer needed horsepower to get from point A to point B. In the late 1870s, you have Thomas Edison experimenting for the first time with the electric light bulb. Just six or so years after that, you have Louis Pasteur, who comes up with the first rabies vaccination, which of course is only the tip of the iceberg as to where the study of medicine and chemistry and all these types of things will begin to go. And of course, the 20th century will reap so many of the rewards of this scientific experimentation. In terms of culture, so many of the books that we know, even though we don't always get a chance to read them in our lifetime, are often the product of this modern world. People like Jane Austen, Mark Twain. It's in 1890, in fact, that Van Gogh himself dies. Charles Dickens, Moby Dick, the Bronte sisters, Walt Whitman, all types of folks are publishing and writing in this day and age in creating a real, what we call, modernistic understanding of literature. It's a real maximalist idea of literature as well, with these really elaborate, detailed, structured plots, with lots of characters and subplots and all these types of different things. Very much part and parcel to the modern novel, as you and I know it. In terms of other areas of science and discovery, it's, of course, in the 1800s where the archaeological record and the geological record gets rewritten. People like Charles Darwin, published findings about the development of the species in a theory that we today call, of course, evolution. But coming along with this, of course, was a geological reassertion as to the datings of the origin of our planet. Many people don't actually realize this, but it's actually in the mid-1800s when you have finally identified the first dinosaur bone and the discovery later of Cro-Magnon man. Real serious archaeological discoveries. And people don't always put that together. We go from a world where no one knew anything like the word dinosaur, any of these types of evidences of a very foggy distant past that gives us some indication as to the origins, or at least to the time span, of how old our planet is. So as a result, people begin to redate and recodify all types of different things. Archaeological digs occur, for example, in the Middle East, attempting to discover biblical or ancient Near Eastern dig sites long thought to be forgotten or undiscoverable. And so there's a real explosion of change, not just in terms of culture or in terms of discoveries, but just in terms of our general orientation of the world around us. It's also in the 1800s that Karl Marx begins to dramatically change and challenge some of the long-held convictions about economics. And in many ways, these changes, these new discoveries, really help us understand the 19th century. It's a century that begins very much remote from our world, a world still very much reliant upon wind and horse in order to navigate the world. By the end, we have electricity, automobiles, developments in medicine, and eventually some new radical ideas that are changing all of the West and eventually all of the global world from the early modern period into the modern period. Mm -hmm.
Great, great. It wasn't too long. <laughs> that was great. great. So now we go to chapter 36, the foes of the faith, which Dr. Reeves referred to some of them in his excellent presentation, uh, the great foes of the faith in the 19th century. And he is the papyri, papyri of the Gospel of John. Uh, basically, there are four of them. We can summarize them to four. Biblical criticism, well, of course, it depends on uh, whether higher or lower form of criticism and what we do with it. Materialism, creation versus evolution, and rise of communism in the 19th and the 20th century. This is a picture of Karl Marx and his friend Friedrich Engels, uh, the, who supported him, and the, together they produced many uh, Marxist communistic literature. Uh, let's uh, start with biblical criticism. Biblical criticism is a scholarly study and investigation of biblical writing that seeks to make discerning judgment about these writings. So, uh, you know, biblical criticism is not necessarily bad in itself. It depends with what, with what kind of presupposition you approach it and what you want to do with it. It can be helpful because through biblical criticism, we can reconstruct the original text, the, the auto, autographic text of you know the original writers, Paul, Peter, John, because we don't have the original writing. We have copies, thousands of copies of the original writing, but through the science of biblical criticism, we can reconstruct them, reconstruct the original autograph or autograph, should I use the original with it? Because autograph means original. And therefore we can arrived at those inerrant writing of the uh, right authors of the uh, scriptures. So biblical criticism can be helpful. It depends on, again, with what kind of presupposition and with what goals in mind you're using it. It asks uh, when and where a particular text originated, ask question of how, why, by whom, for whom, and in what circumstances it was produced with these things are helpful for coming to the correct, proper hermeneutics interpretation of the text. Uh, it asks what influences were at work in its production, what sources were used in its composition, and the message it was in, intended to convey. It varies slightly depending on whether you fo you're focusing on the Old Testament or the letters of the New Testament or the four Gospels. Uh, biblical criticism, as I mentioned, it can be broken into two major forms, the higher and the lower criticism. The lower criticism is, at, is an attempt to find the original wording of the text since we uh, no longer have the original writing. As I mentioned, that's good, that's positive. Higher criticism deals with the genuineness of the text. Uh, ask questions such as, when was it really written and who really wrote this text? Again, uh, uh, nothing wrong with these questions, but depends on with what kind of presupposition you are approaching uh, you're, you want to find answer to this question. For example, if your presupposition is that you don't believe in miracles, you don't believe in revelation from God, uh, if you don't believe in prophecy, then, okay, when you approach, for example, a book such as Book of Daniel, you are forced to deny its prophetic nature and give it a much later date after the events that he prophesies will happen in um, in the, um, in, the uh, in among the uh, the the individuals who inherited this Alexander the Great Empire. You have to put it after those events in order to make sense of the book because you don't believe in prophecy. 
So you see, it, it all depends on your presupposition and how you uh, approach it. Um, uh, many higher critics, unfortunately, do not believe in the inspiration of the scripture, and therefore they use this question to dispel the work of the Holy Spirit in lives of the authors of the scripture. They come with a biased view. They believe that our Old Testament was simply a compilation of oral tradition and were not actually written until after Israel was taken into captivity to Babylon in uh, 15, uh, 5086 before Christ. Now, the, there are a number of different uh, kind of uh, biblical criticism, but beside the two major division. These are the source form and the redaction criticism are the main uh, three uh, forms, different three main branches of biblical criticism. In source criticism, the, the, what you are trying to do, you are trying to uh, find out the order of the writings, especially of the synoptic gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the extent to which one was dependent on another or even earlier sources, which they call it the Q source. But in a broader scope, uh, source criticism is a specialized field of biblical studies that seeks to find out the sources used to develop the final form of the biblical text. Source critic read the book of, for example, Genesis, and ask where did the author get this information? What written document and or oral tradition contributed to a, st a story recorded here? Source criticism can yeah, was used first to analyze secular literature, but in the 18th century and 19th century, uh, through the work of Jean Ostrich, in France began adopting the source critical method for the use of particular books of the scripture. But you see, they come to it with a biased view that they deny the work of the Holy Spirit, inspiration, revelation, and prophecy. That's why they keep asking, where did he get his information? Well, uh, uh, they want to, it's nothing wrong to study that, those elements. The Gospel of Luke talks about that, but we need to remember that it's ultimately it's a work of the Holy Spirit giving inspiration uh, to the writers uh, of what to write. Then another uh, branch of criticism, biblical criticism, is a form criticism. It's a story of forms in which the gospel was orally passed on in the early years before the written gospels. So it tries to figure out the oral traditions, uh, tradition of the gospel. Then we have redaction criticism that examines the way various pieces of tradition have been assembled into the final literary composition by an author or editor. The arrangement, modification of these pieces according to this um, uh, proponent of this uh, redaction criticism uh, they believe can reveal something of the author's intention and by, and the means by which he hoped to achieve them. Now, again, we believe in the proper hermeneutic that we want to find in uh, authorial intention. Um, but, but again, we, we say we believe that uh, you can find that from the scripture itself, from the within the text. Um, it's not that the author changed things. Uh, they may have um, the way that, you know, for like the four, the writer of the four gospel, uh, the four gospels, are they different? Yes, they are. Of course they are different. But are they contradictory? No, they are not. They are different because if they were exactly the same, it would be pointless to have four of them. But they look at the life, ministry, uh, and the uh, teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ from four different viewpoints that complement each other. Anyway, so that was the first problem, the first fall, 
um, biblical criticism, especially the higher form of biblical criticism with bias view and bias presupposition. The second one was, you know, with the industrial revolution, with the expansion of the trade, especially through the sea. Uh, uh, it was a rise of the well-being and financial status of people. You have the problem with materialism. And in many ways, materialism is more dangerous and subtle than the higher criticism uh, because it emphasizes the material value of the high standard of living. It emphasizes uh, the physical value. It basically, you know, how you respond to that is the Lord saying uh, to Satan in Matthew chapter 4, in Luke chapter 4, that the man does not uh, live by bread alone, but by the every word of God. Uh, so it turns man's attention uh, toward this life. Now, nobody is saying that we should ignore uh, the condition of this life, but uh, it's not the end of everything. You know, if you just look at it, that life is what it is right now in this world, that's very, very, in my opinion, um, uh, the sad and gloomy state of affair. It's very depressing if you look at it that way. And the third foe during this 19th century is a rise of evolutionary theory, creationism versus evolution. Uh, and uh, as it was mentioned in the video, Charles Darwin, uh, 1809 through 1882, um, uh, he was a student of philosophy. Um, and, uh, okay, okay, sorry. Uh, do I get there? Hmm. Oh, sorry. I discovered these hypos. Okay, so as a philosopher, he goes back to the time uh, of. No, I'm sorry. Uh, was right <laughs> in the beginning. Um, evolution as a philosophy goes back to the time of Aristotle. Uh, but uh, Darwin uh, took a voyage uh, by the ship around the world and his ship, uh, the ship called Beagle from 1831 to 1836. And as he was going to different islands, he found the differences between living animals and the fossils on the mainlands and the islands. He, he believed it, if the differences are the results of evolutionary process. Then he, in 1859, he wrote his famous book, The Origin of a Species. And he came with the doctrines, uh, the view of survival of the fetus, that different species, they... Um, uh, those among different species that can adapt to the new environment, they will survive and the others will be destroyed. Uh, in his other book, The Descent of Man, he linked mankind to animals. But the, now beside the fact that he was denying creation and you know his views, uh, that's why I, I don't believe you can be a Christian and believe in evolutionary theory because it contradicts the teaching of, for example, Roman chapter seven, uh, you know, in the or other parts of the scripture that talks about Adam as a, a, as a, a one time creation by God, not a result of a process. Uh, you know, if you take the evolutionary view of um, evolutionary theory and try to apply it to the Bible, you will have very destructive consequences. In fact, uh, so the more destructive the most destructive consequences of the evolutionary theory was when it was applied to the uh, biblical field, uh, to the fields of biblical studies. Oh, change again. Sorry.
and to uh, many other fields. Uh, it, it created quite a bit of uh, problem. For example, uh, in in a science of anthropology and cultural anthropology, the religious study, they apply evolutionary theory. They come with this false view that all religion is a process of evolutionary uh, thought that men started with animism and then moved toward polytheism and then eventually arrive at uh, mono monotheism, which is not true. Uh, in fact, you can find elements of belief in monotheistic God in all cultures around the world. Okay. Again, uh, continuing uh, about creation versus evolution, Darwin couldn't explain things such as human conscience, uh, man universal concept of God, and uh, belief in soul. Uh, he ignored the evidence of design on the part of the creator, that if there are similarities between some fossils, it's not because of the evolution, but because of the design of the creator. And again, when you apply, unfortunately it's been applied, this theory to the Bible and God, then um, religious beliefs are, are considered only evolutionary. Um, uh, therefore, uh, the books of the Bible are dated according to the evolutionary view of anthropology and religions rather than uh, you know, biblical evidence, uh, uh, even using uh, biblical criticism to uh, date different books of the Bible. Um, in his view, because there's an evolution and uh, survival of the fetus, so we are improving and becoming uh, evolving. So uh, uh, in his, he, he Dar Darwin's scatology is, man's utopia, man will create a utopia. Um, and when you apply that theory to biblical eschatology, it contradicts the teaching of the book of Revelation that no, we are not evolving, we are going down the hill. Uh, you follow the theory of evolution so that you will not have any original sin, no guilt. Therefore, there is no need for Christ. In fact, there cannot be Christ, a redeemer of humankind because man is not a creation of God. It's just a result of a process. Uh, you need to have a process human. Therefore, you need to have a process savior. And man is not a special creation of God. That view of survival of fetus, in fact, uh, feeds racism and race superiority and feeds war because uh, you know, in Nazi Germany, that's the way that they reason that, for example, the Jews or people who had physical uh, disabilities, they, they must be destroyed. They are uh, uh, of a lower species. They are not fit to live. We must destroy them. And, you know, they took evolutionary theory and they applied to all different fields, such as uh, psychology, such as eth uh, ethics. And they end up with moral relativism. Everything is relative. In fact, I would say that it's interesting. They call, some people call this, in the 19th century, you have this unholy trinity. The unholy trinity of Darwin in the biological fields, um, Freud in psychology, and Marx in socioeconomic fields. And that brings us to Marx and the rise of communism. Uh, again, um, uh, he was influenced by materialistic uh, view of life. Uh, Marx lived in England in the 19th century, influenced by Adam Smith, that um, his basic teaching is labor uh, creates value. And he was influenced by Hegel dialectical uh, theory, threefold level, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. You see, uh, there is capitalism, that's a thesis. Antithesis is a revolutionary proletariat, and synthesis, the result of the 
the clash between thesis and antithesis, you have synthesis. The classless society after a temporary dictatorship of proletariat, but the problem is that the dictatorship of the proletariat is never temporary. Uh, uh, his friend Friedrich Engels, this guy, uh, finance, finance him, supported him. Uh, he spent hours and hours of studies in England. Uh, you know, part of his background, you know, he, he's, uh, both of them were Jewish, uh, but because of the anti-Semitism of his time in Europe, uh, his father pretended that converted and he would take him uh, to church and, you know, say, uh, do a, be involved in uh, church activities. Uh, these are you know, mainly, uh, you know, how many, you know, traditional high churches with high liturgy, without any faith and without any heart belief. And that impacted Marx's view of religion that had influence on him. Uh, being influenced by Adam Smith's view that labor creates value. Um, he also, in his Communist Manifesto, wrote that only labor produces value and it's the key essential for human society. And reality is a matter in motion. Uh, everything is changing. There is no absolute reality. He ignored the problem of sin. He believed that you know, through thesis and antithesis, through interaction between capitalism and proletariat, you end up with a classless society, but he ignored the problem of sin and oversimplified human problems. In his system of teaching, there is no place for God, for the Bible, or absolute moral standard. Uh, Frederick Engels has a book, The Origin of Family, that in it he believed the family structure as we know it, even though it's been under attack in our time, is just a form of a slavery. And he was uh, proposing the banishment of family. Now, in uh, former Soviet Union, after the uh, October Bolshevik Revolution of 1919, uh, they tried to implement his teaching. And the result was a uh, a uh, tremendous uh, increase in the rate of uh, juvenile uh, crimes and alcoholism. And then they realized that they went wrong. They need to have healthy, strong families. Um, you know, there's been always a question in my mind, why Marxism has such an appeal to many people around the world. Uh, some people say because uh, he talks about uh, you know, the underclass injustice, seeking justice for poor people, for working class. Uh, but I think there's something else. Uh, you know, I studied Marxism uh, quite extensively, and I know there is something else there. And the, I believe when you study the Bible, it, it shine lights on what is the mm, appeal of Marxism. The appeal comes in one word, greed basically greed, which is a common human problem, because Marxism teaches that what you have belongs to me. If if you're rich, you're rich out of, out of um, my pocket. You became rich by taking money from me. So what you have belongs to me. So therefore, I am justified. In fact, Marxist uh, um, philosophy encourages person to use force to get what is his, and the rich people has taken that away from him. Uh, so you see, it's a, it's a question of greed. Uh, that's the appeal of Marxism, not concern for the poor people, not concern for the uh, oppressed people, but basically appeal to the greed. Uh, I want what you have, and if you don't give it to me, I am going to take it from you by force. Um, and again, uh, you know, they oversimplify the human uh, human problems, uh, the problem of sin. And also, you know, they they believe in taking control, taking power, and redistribute the wealth. But they have no, never they have any way, any answer how to produce wealth, or just take away the wealth that was produced 
by these bad, evil capitalists. Anyway, so now we come to chapter 37. An American church in the 19th century in the whole uh, national era. Well, let's continue. You see, we had the Great Awakening, uh, but in about 33 years, by the year 1789, the influence of the Great Awakening was vanishing. All right, let me just say it from the beginning. Uh, I believe Great Awakening was a great work of God. We had great preachers, teachers, Jonathan Edwards um, and um, others who um, did great, wonderful work in this country. The second awakening, I'm not too sure about that, and you will see the problems, even the nature of the second awakening and the things that came out of the second awakening. One of the great, I mean, a strong element that damaged the result of the great awakening was the spread of deism. I remember last class we talked about in detail about deism. It comes from the Latin word Deus, meaning God, is a system of belief in transcendent God who created this world but left his creation after he created it to be governed by natural laws discoverable by reason, like a clockmaker who made a perfect clock and then just left it. Of course, you know, I don't want to get into detail, but remember we talked about that, that no matter how perfect is your clock, it needs energy. It needs uh, some form of power to keep going on. So any if you leave a clock by itself, eventually it will die out. Now, how did these um, affect uh, um, Christianity in America? Number one, you know, uh, when there was the during the French and Indian War, um, the and also there were British officers who were in the American continent. Uh, they brought theism from Europe to this country. Uh, theistic literature was important from Europe to America, and then the effect influence of the French Revolution uh, on American universities and the uh, you know fight against uh, the biblical view of God and you know um, there you know remember we talked about the philosoph and the view that they were worshiping the god of logic we have a new form of scholasticism um, they influence american university the same way that uh, after the second world war and when we have the marxism coming to its full uh, uh, growth uh, but during the second world war with the rise of nazism in Europe in Germany, many Marxist professors and writers and thinkers migrated to America and where do you think they landed in universities? Um, and from there, they spread cultural Marxism in this country. Um, anyway. Uh, when you look at the face of the American Christianity in this era of the 19th century, from uh, American Revolution to the time of Civil War, it's ruler and Protestant. But after the Civil War, you have a rise of migration of Roman Catholic in America because of the problems in Europe, you know, famine in Ireland. And so you have these Catholic coming to America and you have a rise of secularism. Uh, and then, uh, the, so the religious scenery of America became pluralistic and Protestantism lost its monopoly. Some terms to remember as we go forward, we, you hear and you read in the chapter about abolition, abolitionist movement. Abolitionism is a movement in 17 and 1800s to abolish uh, slave trade in America. But we will talk about, and we will talk in more detail about inerrancy of the scripture 
it means the inspired human author of the scripture never affirm anything contrary to the truth, contrary to the fact when writing the text that became part of the biblical canon. canon. Revivalism uh, refers to a religious movement beginning in the late 18th century that emphasized the use of human measure to bring about salvation and spiritual renewal. That was common in the Second Awakening and was rooted in the teaching of Nathaniel Taylor, New Heavens, New Haven theology, and popularized by Charles Finney, which I call him a wolf in a sheep clothing. Uh, you need to know about Romanticism, and again, we will talk about it in more detail in 18th and 19th century, there was a reaction against Enlightenment rationalism and even reaction toward these and the Industrial Revolution, which uh, Romanticism emphasized experience and emotion above reason, which has effect in the field of biblical study and effect in the rise of uh, liberal Christianity. Uh, you hear, you read about temperance movement. These were, this was a social reform movement in the 19th century, early 20th century that prom prom prompted, promoted the moderation or absten abstention in alcoholic consumption. The Second Awakening uh, in 1787 started in Hampton, Sydney, a little village in Virginia. It was because of the spiritual concern of three students, I mean, it started good, spread to Washington College, and then throughout the Presbyterian Church in the South. But it was accompanied by strange physical phenomena, falling, jerking, rolling, dancing, and barking. And, and that barking part is also the same element that you find in so-called Azusa Street Revival. There is a lack of a strong biblical leadership in comparison to the first great awakening uh, of 1727. And out of this came lots of not so good uh, movement. Some of the effect of the second awakening was rise of the Unitarian Church in England in 1785. What is the Unitarian Church? It's not a Christian church at all. Uh, denies Trinity in 1785, members of King College, King Chapel, voted to omit all mention of Trinity in the, all their services. Then in 1825, American Unitarian Association was established uh, with 125 congregation. Uh, Unitarian refers to the, you know, the nature of God that we believe is we are Trinitarian, but they deny Trinity. They are anti-Trinitarian. Uh, and they believe that it, it's an old heresy of modalism, that they believe that even the parts in the scripture that talks about the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit, this is just one God that sometimes becomes the Father or sometimes the Holy Spirit, sometimes uh, the Lord Jesus. Uh, so uh, they deny the, the correct biblical doctrine of Trinity. And you cannot be a Christian and deny biblical definition of Trinity. That's why today groups such as Jesus only groups are not Christians. Uh, I think they are called United Pentecostal groups. They are not Christian because they deny Trinity. A very good book to read on the concept of the Trinity is What the Bible Teaches About Trinity by Stuart Olivet. Uh, again, some of the, uh, again, okay, now continuing on the basic doctrines of the Unitarian Church, they believe in the goodness of man, they deny original sin. You see, that goes back to the Renaissance time. It's all, uh, if you deny goodness of man, I mean, uh, if you deny the sinfulness of man, you believe in the goodness of man, they did, you don't need a savior. Then salvation is only by good good things and 
improving your uh, character and your culture. And Jesus Christ is only he was a human being, a good teacher, but no divinity. Because, you know, when you deny original sin, all these will follow. And they believe in the eminence of God, the existence within of God in the human heart. They believe God is in our heart. You see, they take verses of the scripture out of context, such as in Luke 17, the Lord says the kingdom of God is in your heart. They take all right here. Here's the proof text for us. Uh, kingdom of God is in our heart. God is in our heart. But they take it out of the context. They don't look at the context of uh, what Christ is talking in Luke 17. Now, going back to the effects of the second awakening uh, was in there, yeah, there was some good things, improvement on moral character in the front on the frontiers, uh, you know, for um, the um, fight against uh, uh, drunkenness, uh, gambling, uh, immorality. Um, another thing was good thing was the start of the midweek prayer meeting, the start of the Sunday school in America. Uh, many missionary work at home and abroad. The American Board of uh, um, Commission for Foreign Mission established in 1810 by Samuel Mills and uh, other students. Um, again, continuing regarding some effects of the Second Awakening, uh, you have missionaries such as Adoniram Judson, uh, went to Burma or Myanmar, as it's called today. And he, if you read his life, his biography, it's, term, it's very tremendous. You, know, you can see how much this man uh, suffered, he and his family, for the cause of Christ. Uh, he, his translation of uh, his Burmese translation of the Bible is still is in use. And he... Um, uh, started churches in Burma that ended up by 1850 had to have 7,000 members. Another effect of the Second Awakening was Bible distribution and establishment of American Bible Society in 1816 and American Tract Society in 1825. But, you see, there were also negative things such as this person, Charles Finney, I call him a wolf in sheep clothing. Uh, he came to faith in 1821, um, and he used he believes in revivalist campaign using human elements and manipulation to bringing people quote unquote to faith, uh, like the anxious bench and other stuff. Um, he did not believe in the substitutionary death of Christ. That's why I call him a false teacher. Uh, he became the president of the Oberlin College and supported the ordination of women. Now, after the Civil War, we have revivals becoming happening in the cities, urbanized. And one of the great leader of uh, revivals in the cities and evangelists for his D.L. Moody. Uh, he has started Chicago Evangelization Society. He planted Moody Bible Institute and the Moody Church that is still exists. And it's a great, wonderful church. Pastor Erwin Lutzer was its... Um, um, there's some another brother who's a pastor. I forgot his name, but before this one, was Dr. Erwin Lutzer was a wonderful, wonderful preacher. I encourage you to listen to his sermons on the YouTube. Uh, he was a uh, D.L. Moody was a great evangelist. Uh, according to his biography, one time he was criticized by some people uh, that some person, very educated person, told him, "You know, I don't like the way you uh, witness uh, Mr. Moody because." Uh, you don't talk right. You're not very well educated and all that. And Moody said, yeah, I admit I'm not highly educated. I'm not refined. But can I? Can you tell me how you evangelize, how you share Christ with others? And the guy said, well, I just don't do that. I don't like these things, to do things like that. And then Moody responded, well, you know, sir, I prefer my imperfect method of evangelism to your that I'm doing it 
to your perfect method of evangelism that you don't do it. It is non-existent. Now, here we come, some of the negative products of the Second Awakening before, because besides uh, Charles Finney, we have the rise of Mormonism, Joseph Smith. Uh, in this time, he was born 1804, it was, he died 1844. In 1827, he claimed that he had discovered a book of tin golden plate on a hill near Palmar in New York. And he, he claimed that it took him three years to translate those plates. And out of it came the Book of Mormons in uh, 1840 uh, with some other writings. Uh, <clears throat> he he uh, lived, he uh, did his work in Missouri, Independence, Missouri, but he was drove out of that area because of his uh, strange teaching and practice of polygamy. He came to Illinois in 1839, uh, but uh, in 1844, he was killed uh, for raping a 12 years old girl. Now, people say that it was uh, his wife, but nevertheless, again, polygamy, it was polygamous relationship and a 12 years old girl uh, I don't think she's at the age to decide whether to marry or not to marry. But anyway, she was killed. Uh, people in the in that uh, small city were angered about when they hear that uh, he had physical sexual relationship with a 12 years old girl. He was arrested, but the people came and got him out of the jail and lynched him. Uh, then the Mormons moved to Utah under the leader, leadership of Brigham Young, and they started very aggressive missionary work even to this day. They claim to have about 14 million members. Again, my statistic uh, is kind of also, uh, they may have more or less, I don't know. And their church is officially called the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. They are called, and you know, uh, they uh, have a strange view of God and a strange view of Jesus. They deny Trinity. They deny the full deity of Christ. Uh, the, the, in their theology, in their system of thinking, Christ is only a creature. Uh, they accept both the Bible and the Book of Mormons. They deny salvation is by grace alone, faith alone, by Christ alone. It's basically a cult. Now, later on, there, his son, Joseph Smith II, uh, took a group of them and started another church called Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saint. And... Uh, uh, and what he did, they rejected polygamy, but they kept uh, other elements of uh, Mormonism. Now, uh, there is also, as we mentioned, with the spirit of deism in America and romanticism, we have a rise of liberalism in America. Uh, and also the influence of Darwinian evolution theory, because... Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, when you take the Darwin's theory applied to the biblical studies, then uh, you have to deny historicity of the first five books and many other parts of the Bible. Um, you know, you apply that to religious studies, so you view that uh, man's religion is a process of evolution, and they start dating the books of the Bible based on anthropology rather than biblical um, discoveries and biblical criticism. Um, the higher, uh, the, because of the rise of higher form of text criticism through uh, students who studied in Germany, in seminaries in Germany and in Scotland, uh, these uh, ideas of liberalism start growing in America. Uh, such as, you know, for example, Samuel Driver was one person 
who was influenced by a uh, higher form of tax criticism in, uh, in Europe. And also the importation of German idealism. Now, why? What, in order to answer that, first of all, we need to answer, answer the question, what is German idealism? The 19, it says 19th century movement uh, grow from highly independent character of enlightenment in Germany. And the main feature of the movement were the mind dependence of reality. Reality depends on your mind. You create reality. Uh, and uh, dominance of thought over sensation. By your thinking, you can create sensation. By and uh, universalized ethics. Um, so here you can see the seeds of postmodernism. Oh, I'm sorry. Again. Because in postmodernism, you have this. <laughs> a strange and false idea that truth uh, is uh, subjective. You have your truth, I have my truth. Truth uh, differs from person to person. We create our own truth, our mind. Truth or reality is dependent on our, on our mind. The roots of it is right here. Therefore, that when you open the Bible, then it's not a, a propositional truth that applies to all people. It is my interaction with the scripture that makes it the word of God for me. That's postmodernism. That's uh, liberalism, and that's in fact what was what has been taught in some seminaries right now in this country. Not Southern California seminary, but some other seminaries that I'm not going to name. Uh, the word liberalism uh, has more than one meaning. Uh, the philosophical meaning of idealism, I'm sorry, the word idealism, uh, is that the properties we discover in objects depend on the way that those objects appear to us as perceiving subjects. So it is me who look at something and I discover the prop those properties. Uh, not is not something that those the thing itself possesses it uh, possess possess it in themselves apart from our experience of them. In other words, when you analyze when you're studying something, uh, the properties of the object that you're discovering depends on you perceiving those properties. They are not. Uh, properties in that object by itself. If you remember, I gave you an example of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and the use of electronic microscope. You see, here is, you know, Heisenberg was a great uh, phys uh, physicist and his discovery, in fact, in my opinion, uh, is a proof for the need for revelation from outside the box revelation from God, but they took that and applied to all kinds of fields, philosophy, biblical studies, and then they say, oh yeah, like the looking at through electronic microscope, if you remember, I explained that electronic microscope works in a way that they bombard a specimen with electrons, so they become illuminated, therefore you can look, see the, you know, the texture of that specimen. Um, but the point is this, that when you're bombarding it with electron, you're changing the structure, you're changing the texture. So reality is not what it really is. So in this way, yes, um, it uh, the, those property, that reality is what appears to you and me as perceiving subjects that we are looking at that uh, specimen. But that's why we need revelation from outside the box to tell us the truth. Uh, now, I, 
So how can German uh, idealism help the growth of theological liberalism? Because then when you look at the text of the scripture, as I mentioned, is no longer a propositional truth. It's only what appears to you. So you become the judge of the scripture rather than a student of the scripture. Let's watch this video. It helps us to understand German idealism and therefore its impact on biblical studies and the rise of liberalism. Guys, let's start this video by breaking down what we call idealism. We need to first recognize that idealism is a philosophical system. This means it is a broad category, but it's not quite as broad as what we have called the fields of philosophy. Idealism could be seen as a system within the field of metaphysics. But why metaphysics? Well, this is because the dominating theme within idealism is the claim that reality is dependent upon the mind rather than independent of the mind. Thus, as the mind and soul are unobservable aspects of reality, idealism is a metaphysical system. Now, there are extreme versions of idealism. They deny that any world exists outside of our minds, but narrower versions of idealism claim that our understanding of reality, it reflects the workings of our mind first and foremost. That is to say, the properties of objects have no standing independent of the minds perceiving them. Here we should identify some important philosophers that share in these characteristics of idealism. One we've talked about many times before, and that is Plato. Others include George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, Immanuel Kant, and George Berkeley. <laughs> Welcome to our bonus time, which is just a clever way of saying we couldn't fit all we needed to say in 60 seconds. And keep in mind, these videos aren't comprehensive, but an introductory. Even so, there are many different kinds of idealism that we need to talk about. The different kinds of idealism distinguish uh, usually on the point of the mind. Uh, what is the identity and the nature of the mind, more particularly, is the question that they divide on. So uh, some would argue that there is some objective mind outside of nature. Uh, others might argue that is simply the common power of reason uh, or rationality. Uh, others even argue that it is the collective mental faculties of a society. And there are those who focus uh, simply on the mind of individual human beings. So um, let's break it down into four different kinds of idealism. Uh, there's Platonic idealism. Uh, a main characteristic in that, uh, especially dealing with the mind, would be that there exists a perfect realm. Uh, we've talked about this in the forms and ideas. Uh, so there's this perfect realm in Plato's mind, uh, forms and ideas uh, that our world merely contains the shadow of that realm. So that would be uh, an example of Platonic idealism. Up next is subjective idealism. According to this system, only ideas can be known or have any reality. Uh, after that is transcendental idealism. Uh, this is mainly developed by Immanuel Kant. This theory argues that all knowledge originates in perceived phenomena, which have been organized by categories. For more uh, on this line of thinking, check out Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals, written by Immanuel Kant. Uh, here behind me, I prefer the Yale University Press Edition. Fourth and final is absolute idealism. According to this system, all objects are identical with an idea and the claim that knowledge is itself the system of ideas. It is also known as objective idealism. And this is the sort of idealism promoted by George Hegel. Unlike the other forms of idealism, there's only one mind in which reality is created. For more information on this topic, check out the 60 second philosophy blog link. Okay, I realize, um, you know, this is not a course on philosophy, but 
even if you don't get all of it, but just get understanding that. Uh, uh, the comment section, there you will find help. Understanding that uh, in the philosophical meaning of idealism, we are talking about the you are looking at an object, the properties that you see there depends on the way that you as a perceiving person looking at that object, they are not, uh, those properties are not things in themselves. They are not really, uh, that object doesn't really possess them. Take that, keep that in mind, come to the Bible. Then when I am studying the text of the scripture, it is just what I perceive, what comes to my mind, it's real a reality, real truth, not the propositional elements of the scripture. In other words, applying idealism to the Bible, you deny the propositional nature of the scripture that um, it is making universal statement that are independent of us. Uh, truth becomes dependent upon us. And then you end up with postmodernism. Your truth is your truth. My truth is your, your uh, my truth. Okay, this is your interpretation. Well, I have a different interpretation. Uh, and then you have complete chaos. Yeah. Okay, the message of liberal theology is uh, basically a moral influence, ethical message, moral influence of cross. You know, sacrifice yourself, but there is no atonement. There is no idea of a, a, a payment for our sins. They humanize Christ. They believe in the eminence of God in the human heart. We all have God in our heart. Uh, experience takes over the priority over the truth of the scripture. You see that in many uh, charismatic Pentecostal and even today in some non-charismatic groups. Um, scientific methods and natural law takes over the supernatural. Now, nobody's against scientific methods or uh, nobody denies that they are natural laws, but they are there because God created them. And uh, there is no contradiction between science and supernatural science and the Bible. It just, they focus on different area. Uh, there is tension between the Christian faith and philosophy of naturalism, but naturalism is a philosophy, it has nothing to do with scientific uh, methods. Uh, it opposes the doctrine of original sin. And remember, it goes all everything goes back right there. You deny uh, original sin, then you don't need uh, a, a savior. You don't need a substitutionary death of Christ. Uh, Christ, uh, you, it denies that Christ died for our sins to pay the penalty to make atonement for our sins. It starts, uh, you know. Typically, I mean, it's been the case that it starts from seminaries and then goes to churches. You know, those students who are studied under these liberal seminaries, they come to churches. They popularize this idea from the pulpit. But start the problem start right here in the seminaries. They oppose the doctrine of inerrancy of the Bible. Uh, famous people, Charles Briggs, uh, started Union Seminary. It's uh, actually called this place a cemetery. Uh, and then uh, you know, people like Hodges and Warfield opposed him, and they started uh, uh, their own seminary, the Westminster Seminary. Now, what is the doctrine of inerrancy? Uh, it's a belief that we said in the beginning that the author of the different books, all, all the authors of the Bible, when they were writing the original autograph, they whatever they wrote was the truth. Not They never affirmed anything that was not the truth. And importance of inerrancy led, and you know, okay, in the definition of inerrancy, we talk about the original autograph and someone may say, well, you don't have the original autograph. True, 
that's where the science of biblical criticism comes. Through lower biblical criticism, we can reconstruct the text of the scripture and uh, come to that um, you know, confident accuracy in the scripture. Let me give you one example. You know, in the uh, in Washington D.C., there's a museum called, I think it's called the Measurements, uh, uh, Weights and Measurements, something like this. That they have, for example, the, in a um, closed uh, container, glass container, they have a standard of one meter uh, built out of plutonium in. Uh, uh, um, in a enclosed container, glass container. Now, let's say, God forbid, something happened, an explosion happened, that museum was destroyed. Does that mean that we no longer know what is one meter? No, because we have thousands upon thousands of uh, rulers. <laughs> we can put them together. You can come 99% close to the to that standard. Uh, of uh, meter in that museum that we don't have. Let's assume that we don't have it anymore. So inerrancy applies to original autograph. Through textual criticism, we can reconstruct the uh, scripture and come close 99% to those original autograph. But if those original autograph were not inerrant, there is no point, even if you built, uh, you come, you reconstruct 100% of the original autograph. But when it, when the original autograph were, in, were inerrant, you come 99% to that uh, inerrant scripture. And that 1%, if you look at any Greek New Testament or uh, Hebrew Old Testament, we, the scholars have printed, we have them right at the footnotes. They are discussion over very minute and unimportant issue. For example, did Jesus, does it say Jesus went to the city or Jesus uh, went to, to the city or toward the city? Uh, you know, nothing essential. And that's only 1% of the total uh, volume of the verses. Now let's watch this video from GodQuestion.org regarding the importance of believing in biblical inerrancy. Today's question is, why is it important to believe in biblical inerrancy? In this video, I'll answer that question from a biblical perspective. Then afterwards, as always, I'll share some helpful resources. So stick around until the end. We live in a time that tends to shrug its shoulders when confronted with error. Instead of asking, like Pilate, what is truth, postmodern man says nothing is truth, or perhaps there is truth, but we cannot know it. We've grown accustomed to being lied to, and many people seem comfortable with the false notion that the Bible, too, contains errors. The doctrine of biblical inerrancy is an extremely important one because the truth does matter. This issue reflects on the character of God and is foundational to our understanding of everything the Bible teaches. Here are some reasons why we should absolutely believe in biblical inerrancy. First, the Bible itself claims to be perfect, and the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay purified seven times, Psalm chapter 12, verse 6. The law of the Lord is perfect, Psalm chapter 19, verse 7. Every word of God is pure, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. These claims of purity and perfection are absolute statements. Note that it doesn't say God's word is mostly pure or scripture is nearly perfect. The Bible argues for complete perfection, leaving no room for partial perfection theories. Second, the Bible stands or falls as a whole. If a major newspaper were routinely discovered to contain errors, it would be quickly discredited. It would make no difference to say all the errors are confined to page 3. For a paper to be reliable in any of its parts, it must be factual throughout. In the same way, if the Bible is inaccurate when it speaks of geology, why should its theology be trusted? It is either a trustworthy document or it is not. 
Third, the Bible is a reflection of its author. All books are. The Bible was written by God himself as he worked through human authors in a process called inspiration. All scripture is God breathed, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. See also 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, and Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 2. We believe that the God who created the universe is capable of writing a book, and the God who is perfect is capable of writing a perfect book. The issue is not simply, does the Bible have a mistake, but can God make a mistake? If the Bible contains factual errors, then God is not omniscient and is capable of making errors himself. If the Bible contains misinformation, then God is not truthful, but is instead a liar. If the Bible contains contradictions, then God is the author of confusion. In other words, if biblical inerrancy is not true, then God is not God. Fourth, the Bible judges us, not vice versa, for the word of God judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Notice the relationship between the heart and the word. The word examines. The heart is being examined. To discount parts of the word for any reason is to reverse this process. We become the examiners, and the word must submit to our superior insight. Yet God says, but who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Romans chapter 9, verse 20. Fifth, the Bible's message must be taken as a whole. It is not a mixture of doctrine that we are free to select from. Many people like the verses that say God loves them, but they dislike the verses that say God will judge sinners. But we simply cannot pick and choose what we like about the Bible and throw away the rest. If the Bible is wrong about hell, for example, then Who is to say it's right about heaven or anything else? If the Bible cannot get the details right about creation, then maybe the details about salvation cannot be trusted either. If the story of Jonah is a myth, then perhaps so is the story of Jesus. On the contrary, God has said what he has said, and the Bible presents us a full picture of who God is. Your word, O Lord, is eternal and stands firm in the heavens. Psalm chapter 119, verse 89. Sixth, the Bible is our only rule for faith and practice. If it is not reliable, then on what do we base our beliefs? Jesus asked for our trust, and that includes trust in what he says in his word. John chapter 6, verses 67 through 69 is a beautiful passage. Jesus had just witnessed the departure of many who had claimed to follow him. Then he turns to the twelve apostles and asks, You do not want to leave too, do you? At this, Peter speaks for the rest when he says, Lord, To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. May we have the same trust in the Lord and in his words of life. None of what we have presented here should be taken as a rejection of true scholarship. Biblical inerrancy does not mean that we are to stop using our minds or accept what the Bible says blindly. We are commanded to study the word, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. And those who search it out are commended, Acts 17, verse 11. Also, we recognize that there are difficult passages in the Bible, as well as sincere disagreements over interpretation. Our goal is to approach Scripture reverently and prayerfully, and when we find something that we do not understand, we pray harder, study more, and if the answer still eludes us, humbly acknowledge our own limitations in the face of the perfect Word of God. Want to learn more? Subscribe so you don't miss the next video. Visit gotquestions.org for more great content. And check out the details section below this video. There's one book I recommend along with several related questions. If you'd like to learn about Bible Lunch or if you're interested in bite size. Okay. Uh, that was a very excellent presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, um, let me see this there. Oh. Okay, um, so this is also, let me, how many, how long is it? It's about half an hour. Um, again, I'm not sure if I could uh, show all of it, but please watch it by yourself. The whole complete of it, uh, complete video clip, it gives you good, excellent uh, overview of the second great awakening by our dear friend, Dr. Reeves. Let's watch that as much as we can. In this lecture, we're looking at the Second Great Awakening and the changes that it wrought in American evangelicalism. 
And the second great awakening flows out of the time that we've been talking about in general up until this point. The first great awakening, of course, is from 1740, just prior to the American Revolutionary Era. You then flow into this revolutionary desire of the colonies as well as those in the church to separate itself and to chart a new course. When you get to the Second Great Awakening, which is far more diverse and far more varied, both in terms of its scope and in terms of its theology, you see a real rise of the changes that have come about as a result of the American Revolution. Now, we want to stress again, the American Revolution is not about theology and it's not about the church. It's about the political orders and it's about the formation of a new government. But these things always have an effect on culture and the church being part of the culture engaging with the culture, sometimes positively or negatively, means that what ends up happening in the church always takes on some type of the tone of the world around it. What begins to happen from roughly 1780 down until about 1820, 1825, is you see arise a number of different changes, you see arise different denominational groups, and you see the formation of what will form the backdrop of the 19th and 20th century landscape of the American church. Inevitably, what happens whenever you have a revolutionary spirit come upon a culture, and in this case, come upon the church, is you end up having more or less a constant need or a constant belief that things are slipping, that things are falling away, that the church needs to get off the couch and get about the serious work of the gospel. What's always baked into this idea, though, is a certain amount of dystopian pessimism when it comes to the status of the church and the culture. Certain groups tend to believe that if the church is not strong, if it's not going forth and conquering and evangelizing vast numbers of people, that what we're dealing with is a slouching towards the worst side of sin and oppression and secularism. The ironic thing about dystopian ideas of where culture is going, though, is that they always have sort of built in the back end this belief that if we just do things right, that the world will somehow become more or less utopian. What do I mean? Well, in the case of certain denominations at times, particularly when you get to the 1800s, you see proclaim this idea that the church is falling apart, but that this community, this denomination, or this region of the world, maybe even a subset region within America, becomes the bastion of all things that are right and good and true in the world. At times, it comes with the belief that if we just simply recover this doctrine or that doctrine, that finally the church will have its place in culture and will be listened to. In other words, what you see in the Second Great Awakening and the evolution of evangelicalism in the 19th and 20th centuries is not so much a rejection fully of the older models of the role of the church and culture, but often at times it's a mutation of it. And I don't mean mutation in the negative sense. I mean, it simply develops. There is always the assumption here that if the church simply does what it's supposed to do, it will again become a voice for the world around it, and they might even begin to sway things in their favor. This idea of a dystopian world around us and the recovery of something pure and undefiled, a utopian ideal, plays right into the new American ethos of this rugged individualism, this belief that we're supposed to chart our own ways and that it is up to us always to affect our own prosperity. And I've said at one or two points along the way that one of the more natural things that happens during this period of time is that theological systems or denominations that capitalize on this American individualism tend to have a pretty strong role to play in the life of the church. Those denominations that still tout or still affirm a more or less top-down structure or that don't toe the line of rugged individualism that discuss things like sin and depravity and the need to let Christ's work be sufficient only for ourselves, these church traditions tend not to fall apart. They certainly don't go away. But over time, they cease to have the sway of the wider church in America. And you really begin to see this shift in the Second Great Awakening. Now, defining the Second Great Awakening and looking for an exact start point and end date is usually a failing quest. There are things on the horizon as early as the 1780s. It certainly gets underway in full force in the 1800s, and it seems to stop sometime around 1825. And what you begin to see happening here is just what I said. Those denominations and those traditions that tend to be more rooted, 
tend to be more traditional might be the word. Groups like the Presbyterians or the Congregationalists, those who are more in favor of an established, ordinary, slow orthodoxy, you might say, leadership from the top without a lot of the bells and whistles of revivalism. These groups tend to not embrace the Second Great Awakening, and they tend to not plant or to travel to areas where the Second Great Awakening is having its most significant impact. What's going on here culturally is after the end of the Revolutionary War, there is this push to go over the Appalachian Mountains, metaphorically speaking, and to settle and to populate regions that before were not the focus of the colonies. And so you see a dispersion of a number of different folks, farmers and workers and these kinds of things, that head off towards the West. Some of them head more into the Deep South, some of them head up into the Midwest, but there is a population explosion or a dispersion from the colonies over the mountains into these areas. One of the great challenges, though, that happens is a lot of the folks that go are relatively undereducated. And since what is in play here is an expansion of the culture from the East Coast to the Midwest and down into the Deep South, there is suddenly a need for pastors, preachers, and evangelists to go out there to plant and establish churches. And the two most important and pivotal groups that take this task on are the Methodists and the Baptists. In fact, from the Revolutionary War in 1770 down until the Civil War in the late 1800s, the Methodists go from being a ragtag group of circuit rider preachers to the largest denomination in the country. Baptists are right there behind them. The expansion of America, in other words, brings with it an expansion of certain denominations that have an opportunistic spirit to go into these areas and to plant and to cultivate religious life. Presbyterians and Congregationalists tend to stay more in the East Coast, more in the areas where they had always been. Now, of course, some do go. It's not ironclad that only the Methodists and the Baptists go. But in terms of their central mission, the Methodists and the Baptists take on this charge to move to the western parts or the deep south parts of the world. And they do it with pretty serious vigor. Well, the beginning of the Second Great Awakening, properly speaking, actually gets going in Kentucky and other areas around it. It's in Kentucky, in the area of Logan County, where you begin to see a real countercultural anti-institutional camp meeting style of revival and evangelistic preaching. The camp revivals in Kentucky, there in the late 1700s, in fact, would bring together at times somewhere between 10 and 22,000 people. It's just simply a staggering number. What's important about this, though, is this is not clergy or establishment-led. And here you see the connection between the First Great Awakening and the Second. In the First Great Awakening with Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, you had two men that really felt establishment men who could be trusted at times by certain people within the established structures of the institutional church. No one's going to really fault them for their theology or for the quality of their education. But still, they were relatively anti-institutional in the sense that they went outside the bounds of the church to affect their evangelistic preaching. And this is particularly the case with George Whitfield. Here in the Second Great Awakening, though, again, a lot of that revolutionary, rugged individualism really begins to peek its head out here. And just simply the sheer numbers involved with the Kentucky explosion of these big camp meetings, you begin to see that this is having an effect. The other reality, though, is at this time, of course, the Methodists are overtly Arminian. In addition, the Baptists have a very strong Arminian streak within them. There's always a bit of back and forth between Reformed theology and Arminian theology and the life of the Baptist church. In this case, those who are going out to the western parts, to the Midwest, and down into the Deep South, tend to be more of those who are theologically very similar to the Methodists, at least on the subject of salvation and sanctification. They want holy living, though it's obviously run through a different institutional or denominational focus. And we mentioned in our lecture on the Revolution and the American Church that men like Francis Asbury and Thomas Koch go up and down over thousands of miles on horseback, preaching what we call today the circuits. And these men were known as the circuit riders. They simply went everywhere preaching the gospel. They were also very revolutionary in the way that they applied their theology. Both of them were Arminian, and they appealed to this idea in the American ethos that the most important decision one can make with the new freedom that they felt that they had after the revolution is to choose God, to choose the Christian life over against the alternatives. 
Now, obviously, that's not the entirety of their message. They are preaching Christ and renewal and revival. They're preaching evangelism. But the pastoral implications of what's going on here is very much appealing to the idea that what needs to happen here is a life of holiness and sanctification. There needs to be a restoration of society. There needs to be those who are downtrodden brought up and those who are haughty brought low. There's a real egalitarian spirit here within the Methodist circuit riders. And we mentioned, of course, that Francis Asbury even goes so far as to bring into his preaching circuit a man by the name of Black Harry Hosier, who was the first African-American preacher to address a predominantly white audience. Really radical things. And I think we need to stress right here that there are a lot of good things that come out of the Second Great Awakening. The appeal to holy living, to the improvement of the lives of the people around us, brings into the American evangelical culture all kinds of things that had not been there before. Things like Sunday school, a movement that actually got underway to actually educate in the traditional sense. People that had no skills, those who were illiterate, those who needed to have their lives improved. It also brings about the tract and Bible societies, things like the American Bible Society. It's also these folks that tends to stress abolition as a requirement for those who are Christians. In fact, one of the underexplored and underappreciated realities of American evangelicalism, particularly during this time, is the fact that a great number of evangelicals during this time actually take up the cause of abolition. Now, it is certainly not everybody. There are those who, in a traditional mind frame, continue on with the arguments that there are differences of levels of society and that people who are slaves are not really being treated poorly, the kind of head-in-the-sand argument. But the abolitionist movement, it's driven in part by the Methodist movement. The Methodist movement from the very beginning, all the way back to John Wesley himself, is opposed to slavery. John Wesley actually wrote a tract against it very, very violently almost. In fact, as violent as you're going to get Wesley being, just slamming the practice of slavery in America. And so it should be, again, acknowledged that as the Methodist movement from the revolutionary time to the Civil War, as it becomes the lead voice in this most significant denomination in America, its abolitionist stance becomes vital in the run-up to the Civil War. And there are other strengths and weaknesses that come out of this world, which we'll look at in later lectures. Still, though, the Second Great Awakening is often noted for some of its excesses and its abuses when it comes to the revivalistic spirit. And this is noted by both religious historians and just simply historians of American culture. There are so many excesses and an ongoing reliance on revival and big tent meetings and this kind of individualistic approach to the Christian life that obviously there are going to be opportunities for abuse and for problems. Now, some of these abuses are unintended consequences of the Second Great Awakening. Others are more or less people that should have known better or should have been stopped. But because of the ongoing anti-institutional model, because those who were in power before are no longer the lead voices and they can no longer censure or stop rogue voices from leading a charge for revival, often in American evangelicalism beginning here from the Second Great Awakening, we see some of the checks and balances that have been there from the beginning no longer having its punch. And you see this in places like what's called the Burned Over District. The Burned Over District is an area in New Jersey, New York, that became more or less a crisscross, a kind of crossroads of so many of these revivalistic circuits that there ended up being a staggeringly high number of revivals preached in this one area alone. In fact, compared to other areas of America, the Burned Over District becomes the most reviled, you might say, to coin a word, area after the Revolutionary War. And people have done studies of this to this day, in fact, and certainly shortly after the Great Awakening. The name Burned Over District is used because so many of the populace there just got simply numb and tone deaf to the constant revivalistic preaching that came into their community, that there is a residual effect, perhaps, of so much excess when it comes to revival preaching and no opportunity or no strategy to put down deeper roots of a more ordinary, regular church life. Of course, the man who often gets the lion's share of the blame for the excesses of the Second Great Awakening is Charles Finney. Charles Finney was born in 1792. Many lived a good long while. He died in 1875. Finney is a pivotal figure because what he does is he doesn't simply preach revival. He actually kind of cans it and packages it and makes it a method 
is how other people could reproduce revivals in their own communities. Fenny had been a Presbyterian. He eventually rejects Presbyterianism, and he embraces something that comes to be known as the new divinity. And this is essentially Arminian in perspective. Fenny never quite gives up all of his Presbyterian roots or his Presbyterian theology, but he is overtly Arminian in his understanding that it is the free choice of the individual to accept God and not a matter of God's election or choice of the individual. And the theology and the application of Finney to the revivalistic spirit of the Second Great Awakening is often misunderstood. It's sometimes alleged that because he's Arminian, he is therefore manipulative. Actually, there are a lot of people who are Arminian during the Second Great Awakening who are not manipulative. Finney's choice, though, was to argue that the result of revival could be manipulated. In fact, he printed up a number of how-to manuals in which he talked about ways for people to stoke up revival because you could manipulate the free will of the people involved. And this is certainly far beyond anything that the Methodists would be doing. One of the more famous ones that Finney invents is something called the anxious bench, which would be a bench up towards the front of the service. And if someone feels that they're on the verge of a real embracing of the gospel, or if they feel that they are on the verge of God coming upon them to really give them one of these ecstatic experiences, they would go up and sit on the anxious bench, and then all the prayers and the focus of those in the audience or the preacher himself would then churn and be directed towards this person. Sort of a pressure cooker of emotional and spiritual output when it comes to the anxious bench. And for whatever reason, whether it's spiritual or simply psychological, the anxious bench and the methods of Finney were successful to a certain extent, though they were always considered to be problematic by the majority of Christians and evangelicals in America. One of the other except. Okay. Uh, sorry, because of the time, uh, there are only about 10 minutes, nine minutes left. You can watch the rest of it by yourself. That's the, our session. That's our lecture for session four. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. God bless you and see you next week.